Thanks for the invite today. Um, first up, I really need to um, acknowledge Gary, uh, Rich Evans, who I've just seen walked into the room, so welcome, Rich. G'day. And uh, Danny Ceccarelli, who's a recently, uh, recently new collaborator to this project. Um, so we're going to bring the focus back to the Great Barrier Reef and, um, and give you a little story about what's going on there at the moment. Um, OK, that's laser, that's forward. OK, so really when we're talking about no-take marine reserves, we're talking about places that are completely off, off limits to fishing or any other sort of extraction. Um, and really they're set up for either biodiversity conservation or sustainable fishing. So in terms of biodiversity conservation, what we would hope to do is to uh, protect representative habitats and communities, species, and to, to establish a network of reserves um, which, are, which are connected by uh, larval dispersal. Um, and in that way boost uh, resilience in an ecosystem scale. Um, in terms of sustainable fishing, what we're most interested in is protecting spawning stock biomass within reserve boundaries and uh, potentially providing some sort of uh, recruitment subsidies to surrounding fished areas as well as maybe some more localised spillover benefits. Um, so just about anywhere in the world where, where reserves have been set up in the right place and they're of an adequate size and they've been given adequate protection, um, we see a build-up of target fish biomass within boundaries and, and this is something that's been shown time and time again. Um, this should lead to increased reproductive output per unit area of reef um, and hopefully that does translate into some sort of benefits for the surrounding fished areas. Not that obviously reserves are the, the be-all and end-all or the silver bullet of uh, marine conservation because they're certainly not, um, but they're, they're, they're a really powerful tool potentially if they're well designed um, to help achieve sustainability. Um, so, uh, come on, battery's gone dead. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Uh huh. Right. Okay, so then when we're talking about disturbance, Nick's already touched on this and several other people have today as well. We're really talking about acute disturbances, these one off things like uh, coral bleaching events, um, outbreaks of drupella or cots. Um, storms, flood plumes, and oftentimes these are compounded on top of, of chronic stresses um, like overfishing or destructive fishing practices, um, coastal development or pollution. So you get these things pu uh, you know, sort of pulling together and, and what, it, what it eventually can do if, the, uh, if these acute uh, pulse disturbances come too frequently and they're quite severe, we can end up with a situation on the, like on the bottom here where we're going from a healthy reef through uh, loss of structural complexity of the reef matrix and then pushing over here towards an algal dominated uh, reef. And uh, oftentimes, once reefs are in that state, they're quite persistent in that state and it takes a lot of, a lot of uh, inertia to get it back the other way. Um, you've got to overcome a lot of inertia to get it back the other way. Okay, so what we've been doing for about the last decade or so is, is trying to assess the effects of zoning on inshore areas, inshore fringing reefs on the GBR, GBR Marine Park um, we established the program in the late 90s um, and we expanded it in 2004 to coincide with the implementation of the new uh, representative of areas program um, zoning plan for the reef. Um, we've got about 100 sites in the, in the Palms, uh, the Whitsundays and the Keppel Islands. Uh, and we've got, so you can see there's, there's a fair bit of um, site replication within each island group. Um, uh, 50 of those sites are in areas that are closed to fishing and 50 of those sites are in areas that are open to fishing. Um, we use underwater visual census on scuba, um, pretty standard methodologies. We've got five transects in each site. Um, we survey uh, about 150 to 200 species of fish. We also survey the benthic community and we, we also measure habitat complexity on each transect. Um, now on the GBR and in Australia generally, we fish a very, very small range of species. And um, number one on coral reefs is, is coral trout. Um, and on these inshore fringing reefs, we're really talking about recreational fishing effort. Uh, there's very little, if any, um, commercial fishing on these reefs, at least within the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, originally, there would have been commercial fishing there, but that's all moved further offshore to the mid-shelf and outer shelf these days. Um, so it's, it's, it's recreational fishing, and we were lucky enough to source some... Um, some uh, data from uh, Dr Tony Ayling from the early 80s, um, which he, he collected in the Palm and Whitsunday Islands. Um, and that just pretty much shows that in the areas that have remained open to fishing, tracking through between the late 90s and, and 2009, um, we've seen more or less a flat line. There's a bit of variability there, as you'd expect, but there's this 
really quite large divergence and persistently um, uh, higher biomass of coral trout in the protected areas than in the adjacent fished areas. Um, so, come on. Okay, so this is where the uh, reserves were implemented in the late 1980s. Um, and then in 2004, with the new reserves that came in, uh, we saw, again, a fairly dramatic um, trajectory in the green zones um, in the first few years. We know that in the Palm Islands, we've had a bit of a compliance problem. And uh, we have a big uh, uh, indigenous community on Great Palm Island. And, uh, and they actually operate under, under native title, um, which overrides um, the marine park legislation. So they're actually allowed to fish the green zones. Um, but we also have some, some poaching problems from, from white Australians and travellers and other people as well. So it's a bit of both. But we've certainly seen a really major breakdown in compliance, particularly since 2008. But it's probably been there from the start. Um, in the Whitsundays, it's been better. But we have seen this big drop again in the last couple of years. And we're not quite sure what this is. But when you look across the board, really, in the old reserves, we're seeing about three and a half to one as, a, as an average across um, the years from sort of 2000 through to 2009. And in the new reserves, Palms, 1.6 to one. Which Sundays about 3.8 to one. So pretty significant, um, pretty significant uh, zoning effects there, at least for trout. And when we look at other target species, we do see some some uh, benefits like this, but nothing's as strong as it is for trout. It's really just the number one thing that always stands out. Um, when we look at coral cover and the trajectory in, in hard coral in the Palm and Whit Sunday Islands across the time that we've been looking, um, it's been a relatively flat line as well. Um, you know, with the Palm Islands hovering around 30% um, hard cover, hard coral cover, and in the Whit Sundays around about 40. Um, but that contrasts with the Keppel Islands, where we've had several major uh, disturbances in the last 10 years. Um, in 2002, there was a bleaching event um, on the GBR, and that did, did impact the, the Keppels um, to a degree. But in 2006, there was also a fairly localised bleaching event in the southern GBR, and the Keppels got hit quite hard in that, in that event. Um, now, this year, in 2011, we had this extreme wet season in Queensland, and we got a major flood plume. So this, uh, this dark, smudgy patch out here shows you the extent of that flood plume. That's the Swains reefs out there. That's the Capricorn Bunker reefs, and the Keppel Island's sitting right in there. Um, so they're, they're two quite different disturbances, um, and the impacts in the islands have been different as well. But uh, really what it's led to is, is um, declines in, uh, in hard coral cover. We've got, uh, in 2006, we had about a 25% relative decline across all uh, 2022 20, monitoring sites in the Keppels. And in 2011, due to the flood plume, we've seen the biggest decline uh, yet of at about 42.5%. But you see, oops, back. But you see between um, 2006 and 2009, there was incredible recovery. Um, in the Keppels, and part of that was, um, was due to regrowth um, from remnant uh, coral tissue on branches, on, on Acropora branches, which had actually regrown over, over, uh, over the dead tips, which was quite a phenomenal uh, situation. But the recovery was, was very quick, but it, wasn't, it largely wasn't driven by new recruitment. It was driven by recovery of, of in situ colonies. Um, in 2002, we don't have any, any um, pre-disturbance data for that, for that, but um, my suspicion is that it was a similar sort of, sort of event, maybe not even as extreme as the, uh, the 2006 event. Whereas the flood plume in, in um, 2011 is really quite different. So when we break it down by zone and we have a look at what's going on there, um, you can see that there's really very little divergence between zones and, and you know, we wouldn't expect there to be. Um, so it's pretty much doing exactly what we would expect um, it's really, this is much more a function of where the green zones are located and, and where the flood plume extended to. It's not as, it's, there's no real zoning effect going on here. It's more to do with hydrodynamics and the extent and patchiness of the disturbance. Um, so when we look at sort of more getting towards the benthic community structure, you can see in 2009, this is just a multi-dimensional scaling plot. Um, so this is a, our site means in, uh, for 2009 in the open triangles and, and the closed uh, black triangles of 2011, um, you can see that we've got a, a fairly significant shift 
from um, 2009, where, where a lot of the sites are dominated by hard coral, some soft coral, and also macroalgae, um, which was partly a seasonal effect, um, but, but partly um, just an interesting arrangement in the keppels where you have uh, a quite a, a tight uh, uh, relationship between Acropora coral and Lobophora, and it's quite a tight cycling between those, those groups. But in 2011, the important thing is that a far greater proportion of the sites are skewed over here towards dead hard coral. Um, now, when we looked at the fish community, um, this is what's going on. In, in um, 2009, most of the sites were over this side, dominated by planktivorous pomocentrids. They're numerically very abundant. They, they dominate this sort of analysis. Um, but they're really driving out, out this way. Um, and then post disturbance in 2011, we've got a much greater proportion of things like territorial pomocentrids, the, the farming uh, pomocentrids. Uh, general sort of benthic invertebrate feeders, um, like that little uh, pseudolabris there. And then um, we also have a great proportion of uh, roving herbivores on our reef slopes, that we're, on our monitoring sites. But to a lesser degree, we're also seeing quite an effect on coral trout. So we would expect, we would expect strong effects for things like these guys, these guys, which obviously rely heavily on coral, um, but we wouldn't expect such a strong effect for coral trout. And uh, this is the relationship between hard coral cover in the Keppel Islands between 2002 and 2011, hard coral cover in the blue line and Plectropomus coral trout, the orange line. Um, it's almost an uncanny relationship going on there. Um, and this is just a, a regression of one versus the other with an R squared of about 0.8. So to my knowledge and from, what, from my reading, I haven't seen anything that's, that's been as clear as that, that loss of coral cover is actually driving all the way to the top of the food, train, top of the food chain. Um, so this is obviously fairly significant. We're talking about a highly important um, commercial species. Um, this is something that, uh, that we're very interested in, in following up on. Um, OK, so moving on. If we break that down within the Keppel Islands, break that down by zone, you can see that um, across, across all those years, um, the mean biomass differential, both in the old reserves on the left and the 2004 reserves on the right, is around about 3 to 1. After the, um, after the 2011 uh, flood plume and the disturbance, we've still got about 3 to 1, almost 4 to 1. Um, so I guess the answer to the, um, to the title of this talk is, you know, do marine reserves work in highly disturbed reef systems? The answer is it, it depends. It depends on the scale of the disturbance. It depends on the species that you're interested in. It depends on what the reserves are really protecting. And on the GBR, what they're really protecting is, is big predatory fish. We don't fish all the herbivores. We don't fish pomocentrids. You know, we, it, so, but it, the, the fact is that this, this disparity is true. Um, we obviously need to continue uh, some temporal monitoring, and we've got funding to do that. Um, but I find it interesting that you know, the long-term average across these uh, is 2.8 to 1, and it's 3.8 to 1 after the disturbance. So there's some weak evidence at this point that the reserves might be giving some some pretty significant benefit, um, for trout at least. So sort of just to, just to sort of break that down a bit further, um, when we look at live hard coral, we've got sort of the stop, stoplight kind of scenario going on here. Um, greater than 50% hard coral cover up on the green dots, uh, less than 20 in the, in the red dots. So I really was just interested in having a look at where the refuges were after this 2011 flood plume. Where are the refuges for, for hard coral in the Keppels? And you can see that really, the refuges are in areas further towards the east of the island group, uh, out here, Egg Rock, Barren Island, and some of these places towards the east. The ones on the west, where the flood plume was, was much more severe, um, tended to do a lot worse. Um, so the refuges of corals seem to be fairly evenly distributed between protected and fish zones. Whereas when we look at coral trout and where the refuges for coral trout are, we're talking about here about um, sites where there's more than 200 kilograms per hectare of coral trout, um, you can see that, again, they're towards the east, but they're all in green zones. There is no refuges of coral trout left in blue zones. They've all been fished down. Um, so it is recreational fishing, but recreational fishing in these little high-use areas where you know, total, total reef area in this island group is about 700 hectares, it can have a really significant effect, and it can really drive trout populations down locally. 
So it's not surprising that we get these strong reserve effects, and it's not surprising that after a disturbance event that these green zones are really the places where we're going to have um, refuges for, for things like coral trout. Now, these are going to be important places for reseeding this island group in the, in the coming years. So um, that's how important... The question is, how important are these, these areas to, to local uh, resilience of coral trout populations? How, how much will, will this uh, larval supply from these places drive recovery? I mean, obviously, when these, when these sites are getting disturbed, the coral trout don't all die. They've got fins and they can swim. So they're moving. And, and in a lot of these inshore island groups, there isn't really depth refuge. Uh, high biomass of coral trout might be under a little more uh, intense predation pressure, a little higher usage, while these other areas are in a sort of degraded state. So in the last sort of three or four years, um, we've been running a project in the Keppel Islands where we've been looking at larval connect connections and we've been uh, looking at export effects of, of uh, marine reserves. And we've been using uh, genetic parentage analysis to, um, to track the dispersal of larvae from reserves to surrounding fished areas. Um, now, we, um, I won't go into too much of the details, but we've been able to assign about 58 out of 500 juveniles that we've collected back to at least one parent inside one of these three focal marine reserves. Um, now, when we do the maths and we scale up for the unsampled proportion of the adult populations and we scale up for reef area, um, we can work out that um, these three focal reserves are supplying around about 25% of the total coral trout recruitment to the island group. And that was over a period of about 18 months. So this, the, the reef area within these three reserves represents about 14 or 15% of the, to of the total reef area within the Keppels but it's providing about 25% of the total recruitment. So these, these reserves are punching at well above their weight in terms of larval supply. And uh, I guess that's the, the, the core point of this talk, is that, of course, marine reserves can't do much for um, uh, reducing the scale of the disturbance initially, but they can, for things like coral trout and the things that we're really trying to protect within reserves, they can help drive recovery. And I think that's, that's an important point. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, collaborators on this as well, so that, on this component of the project. Um, now, so just to sort of sum up what, we're, what this is all about, um, it's pretty clear that we've got, um, you know, clear differentials in mean density and biomass of coral trout between zones. That's been persistent through time. And uh, in most well-protected reserves, the average is about three to one for biomass. Um, OK, so these, these biomass um, differentials can be maintained in disturbed systems, but that depends on the severity of the, um, the disturbance, the scale of it, whether there is local uh, refuges which these fish can move into or not, um, the patchiness, and of course, the frequency of the stir disturbance. Um, so it's kind of a double-edged sword, um, because if you have a disturbance which wipes out all the reefs in, say, the Keppel Islands as a case study, you might end up in a situation where you're just really talking about a dribble of recruitment coming in from outside that's going to drive your recovery, and it could potentially take a long time. So protecting local sources is, is very important uh, to, to having long-term resilience of these populations. Um, so maintaining biodiversity within reserve, within a network of reserves, minimising these chronic disturbances, and that might give us a better, better chance of, of these reefs being able to, or reef systems being able to withstand these acute disturbances that, that come uh, seemingly with greater and greater frequency. Um, so effective reserve networks can provide refuges and enhance recovery of the system, supply larvae to degraded areas. And these local refuges can be extremely important, particularly in areas like the Keppels, where the preliminary data are showing us that the levels of larval retention are extremely high. And the supply of larvae from more distant reefs, the next nearest big reef system is the Capricorn Bunkers, about 70 kilometres away, could be quite limited and temporal, temporally inconsistent. Um, so that's really the key message, and um, I'd like to thank all those sponsors for, for making this work possible.